Hey friends, Father Edgar here, and welcome to this new episode of this channel. Before we proceed to the next video, I would like to say thank you for those who were instrumental in procuring this new camera that we are using. I have been told you before, I was just using a simple webcam. It was doing pretty well, but thank you very much for those sponsors. So much with that, let us now introduce our topic for today. Love moves us to seek and desire the presence of the Beloved. These words from my favorite saint, St. Thomas Aquinas, touch the very logic of the use of images in the church. To have an image of someone is to have a tangible remembrance of the person whom we love. Somehow, it compensates the physical absence of the Beloved. Of course, we keep the images of our family members, our loved ones, our friends, in our homes, in our workplace, in our phones, or even in our wallets. The Israelites are not different from us when they wanted to keep a physical representation of God for themselves. Isn't it just proper that wherever they may be, they can have a tangible and physical representation of God whom they serve? But we know that famous commandment, that prohibition from God, not to make any graven images of him, which we read at the beginning of Exodus chapter 20. Is this a general prohibition of making images? Certainly not. In various occasions, we can see the Lord even commanding the Israelites to make certain images. Let us take, for example, the chapter 25 of Exodus, where the Lord commanded the Israelites to make an image of angels to be put at the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, which will be placed in its proper location, which is the Holy of Holies of the Temple in Jerusalem. What about that? And also in the book of Numbers, the Lord told Moses to make a bronze image of a serpent to be put in a staff so that those who were beaten by the snake may not die. All this instructions from God to make images certainly clarify that what He prohibits is the making of an image of God. Because God is spiritual, there is indeed a difficulty in making an image of God. Because even outside divine revelation, our metaphysical concept of God requires that He be an infinite being, source of all perfections, of all goodness, and all beauty, and all the other excellent realities. In fact, all the knowledge that we can have of Him is only an approximation and a, a kind of comparison by negation because we do not know in a daily basis what is an infinite being. We know finite beings, our own finiteness. We do not know perfect beings. We know imperfections in, in its absolute sense. There, we, it's not a daily experience of man to encounter what we describe as God. What the Israelites wanted to make, which is what is behind the prohibition in Exodus, is a physical representation of the infinite God, the almighty and ever-living God. What it's like is striking a comb and saying that it is as beautiful, it is a representation of the symphonies of Beethoven. But there came a new era, a new law is given, when God took irreversibly the human nature in the mystery of Incarnation. The Son of God, in His infinite perfections, equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit, assumed human nature in the fullness of time to fulfill the, uh, the plan of God to make a share in His own blessed life. In the mystery of Incarnation, God lived as a man. God talked as a man. He ate, he drank, he got tired, he got all the difficulties, he even died and rose again as a human being. Through Jesus Christ, the being of the divinity is fully represented in a human form. And what can we say of those errors of trying to represent God? Well, rejoice divine image makers because God did not actually deny giving an image of, him, of Himself. Aside from creating man in His own image and likeness, 
God permanently took the human nature to fulfill His plan to make humanity sharers of divine nature. It is in the incarnation of the Son of God that we encounter the motive and the legitimacy of the making and the use of sacred images in the church, in, even in our homes, and even in public places like in the streets. The Son of God has assumed a human form, and Jesus is permanently united to the human nature, which has physical dimensions. We can always represent Him in carvings and sculptures, in images and icons. We can always make beautiful and dignified representations of Jesus Christ and those who have been made one with Him, like the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints who are our heroes of the faith. And of course, of angels, which even in the Old Testament were already represented, as we have mentioned earlier. The sacred images remind us of those that they represent and not as part or physical presence of them. No amount of fervor can make a Christian think that they are more than representations of sacred persons, facilitating us in our senses to direct our minds and hearts to those that they represent. Friends, thank you for tuning in to this episode about the use of sacred images in the church and the underlying principle in this practice. Don't forget to subscribe and share this video to your friends. For the next episode, as suggested by a good friend and classmate in high school, we will be talking about the, uh, the real presence of God in the Holy Eucharist.